guppies to groupers, tropical and marine fish in the home aquarium. Your host, Paul Spies. We're going to talk today about another one of the large families of very common fish, fish that everybody has kept, the beginner's fish, I guess, and that's the tetra. More uh, precisely, the Caracidae is the group we're going to take a look at. Now, when you went out and bought that first 10-gallon aquarium, almost invariably one of the first fish you brought home was some kind of a tetra because they're so they're small. The guy told you they're nice community tank fish. And, you know, you brought those back home. And he did well in the tank, so everybody starts with the tetras. It's just a beautiful fish. Now, the tetras vary considerably. They vary in you know, size, shape, and everything, but we all have seen neons and cardinals. You know how small they stay even when they're mature. They vary up to the size of some of the piranhas and the uh, colosoma, some of the bigger piranha-type fish, some of the long pike-type tetras, if you will. And these fish are rather awesome, especially in the type of teeth they have. <laughs> I had a piranha at one time. He was well-equipped with the choppers. Oh, he was only you know, eight inches long or so, maybe about that high because they get very thin at that, uh, that tetra, typical tetra shape, if you will, a rather thin fish. And he was, of course, tying up his own 20-gallon aquarium, which bothered me a little bit, but, you know, I'd had the piranha for five years and the, the love was wearing thin, if you know what I mean. Now, tying up a 20-gallon tank right next to him was another guy where the love was wearing a little thin, I had the old albino catfish that I told you I had that got out of the aquarium for so long, you know, and the kids called it whitey. Beautiful fish, but it got mean. Old Rotten Ralph he used to go around butting everything in the tank. Finally got to the point I couldn't keep him with anything else. And at that point, he was all almost two feet long and so big around. So I thought, well, maybe Rotten Ralph and the piranha were both so miserable I could put them together. Yeah, we'll give it a whirl. So I was working down there one Saturday, you know, with the 25 aquariums, there's always enough to do. I put Rotten Ralph in with the uh, piranha. And I watched and I watched. Now, as I said, his trick was he butted everything. And boy, he just gave that piranha the business. Back and forth in that tank, continually butting that big broad side of the piranha. And this went on for a couple hours. And finally got around lunchtime and I went up to grab a sandwich. And I was gone, I'll bet you, 15 minutes at the most. And while I was having lunch, the piranha was also having lunch. When I come down, old Ralphie's hanging there, head up in the water with three or four bites about that size gone out of his body, like a razor cut. So there goes old Ralph. But the piranhas are an awesome caricity, an awesome tetra, if you will. We're going to talk today about the little guys, the ones, the gems, the community tank fish. Because you look in almost anybody's community tank, you're going to see tetras, maybe half a dozen of them. There's so many different kinds. The big tank set up here with a real mix of fish in it has some tetras in there, some black tetras in here. They're rather common. There they are. People like these because of that unusual size anal fin there on the bottom. And the stripes are rather prominent. That's Gymnocorimbus ternetsi. But everybody keeps the tetras. It's a nice little fish, and they don't get too big. And as I say, they're perfect community tank fish. All of them have teeth, by the way, regardless of the size. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, the tetras are found in South America, Central America, and in Africa. And the fact that they're found both in South America and Africa pretty much the way the distribution of the cichlids is, lends a lot of support to the argument of archaeologists, these type of people, that at one time, the two land masses were joined. That is, South America and Africa were part and parcel of one land mass and are floating apart. Because the chance that the typical development of the tetra would occur in two places, that is, Africa and South America separately, is almost impossible. Of course, today they're separated by the Atlantic Ocean, but we can't kick about that. We're getting some pretty beautiful fish out of the Atlantic Ocean, too. We talked about saltwater fish, and we're going to do a lot more on it. So we can't kick about the Atlantic Ocean, but 
The fact that the tetras show up in two very far apart places, separated, says that at one time, possibly, they may have been joined. Now, uh, next week, when we get together, we're going to talk about breeding of fish. And before we get off the big tank, I'd like you to take a look at something. This cluster of plants in the corner that you can see just the top of is a whole bunch of cryptocranes. And I told you at one time that it's growing in a uh, planter that I made out of the bottom of a plastic milk jug. You remember that? Well, now, right down at the bottom, get out of there. Uh, let me get my shtick, because that guy's in the way. He gets his basic fish net. This is not for tetras now. This is a little bigger fish you use this. I'm not going to move the kisser down a line. So long, kisser. And because uh, I want you to see what's behind where the kisser was. There's a pile of sand there. Now, that sand is coming from that planter that's up in there. There's two small albino convicts are getting ready to breed. And they're emptying out my planter, which I'm going to give them a little business because that's my planter. But at any rate, we got some breeding going right on right in the aquarium here in the big 220. And that's typical. That's typical. If the water's right and the uh, food is good and varied, as I've said so many times, we shouldn't have a problem with fish breeding. And that also applies to the tetras, despite what you may have heard what you may think. If you're doing things right in terms of water quality, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, and if you're feeding them a good varied diet, you can expect them to spawn. In fact, chances are they spawn a lot in your community tank, and you don't realize it. it usually comes with first light, and uh, they eat the eggs on the next pass through, and of course all the other fish in the aquarium are after the eggs too. So we'll talk a little bit about breeding. But well, let's talk about the tetra. First of all, early in the description of these fish, on a scientific basis now, all of the tetra types were put in one family. Now, lately, there's been a lot of work done on that particular area. And the family, which was the Caracidae, which included all of the tetra types, now includes these small fish that we're going to be looking at today. That's what I want to talk about the Caracidae family. Now, besides that, at the same time that they limited this family, they also created a, oh, about 15 more that include such fish as the pencil fish, hatchet fish, some of the Africans, the anostomous leporinus types. So we'll take a look at those at a later date. But this family now is smaller, contains most of the specimens we're going to see today, in fact, all of them. And there are a lot more families to take a look at. Now, remember what we said about family, where that stands. Species is that particular fish. And we go up to genus and then family. If we go up the next step, the order up here, the Saprinoforms, contains three families. One the, uh, that has all the barbs and barb-type fish in it. Another one that has the South American gymnotid-type knife fish eel-like fish with that ripply fin. You've seen some of those. We've had a lot of them on. And finally, the tetra family. And that's what we're going to take a look at right now is some tetras. Now, they are uh, very, as I said, from in size, from very small fish up to very large fish. The uh, difference, primary difference between them and the barbs, because there's a, a look-alike kind of a thing goes on there, is the fact that the barbs all have whiskers. Barbels, like the catfish. Now, they're not near as prominent. And on small barbs, you may have not have noticed them. But you take a close look, you'll see them. But the barbs have these whiskers. Tetras have none of that. Besides that, the tetra teeth are much, much stronger developed. Very obvious in some of the larger tetras. In this tank right behind me that I covered up so cleverly, there's very prominent teeth. But we'll, we'll see them. You can see that at that time. And the... Uh, Teeth are on the lips, the mouth, all of the bones and the throat parts and that. And of course, when we get up into the case of the old piranha, they're quite awesome in terms of their dentition. So the one, one big descriptive thing is a difference in the mouth area. The other one is that on the backs of the uh, tetras, now let me draw a tetra. The tetra tail is deeply notched on most of them like that, like you see here. 
Now the dorsal fin is up here. And of course this is the tail fin. On the backs of the tetra is a wee little fin here, the adipose fin. And that is found on almost every one of the tetras, the adipose fin. That is not found in the barb family. So if you ever got a question, that's one easy way. Now it's very prominent in the bigger tetras, the little ones you have to look for it sometimes, but it's always there, sometimes transparent. But the adipose fin is a deciding characteristic in these tetras. Now besides that, the tetra internally is a fish. It's a fish is a fish kind of a thing. No accessory breathing organs, no unusual development, except that connecting the swim bladder, and you remember the balloon now that's in the fish that allows him to float wherever he wants, connecting that with the outside world, if you will, through his ears, are four unusual bones, the ossicles, that connect that swim bladder with his ears, as I say, and allow him a greater hearing ability. Now, whether hearing or sensitivity to vibration in the water is what goes on in the fish world, because you stick something in the aquarium, the fish get excited whether they see it or not. That's a moot point, whether it's hearing or vibration, but fish do hear. Tetras hear a lot better than other fish, so as a result, they're rather nervous, jumpy fish. Now, as far as Breeding the tetras, uh, the great majority of tetras, very simple, good water. And I'm going to say a little bit more about water because that is a critical concern with some of the tetras. Good water and good feed, probably not a problem. And the tetras breed in a typical minnow fashion, if you will. That is the male and female race through a thicket of plants. She expels the eggs. He's right beside her, behind her. They're rolling. He expels the sperm. The eggs are fertilized. They are, in most cases, adhesive or semi-adhesive. And then floating down, they stick on everything or they get into peat moss, if that happens to be what you're using in the bottom. And if the fish meet them, 30 seconds later on the next pass through the aquarium, they're going to eat them all up. So you say, well, I've tried to breed tetras, and I've never had any luck. Key word here is vigilance. You really got to watch them like a hawk. The tank has to be set up to be ready to breed tetras, and you've got to get those breeders out after the eggs are laid and fertilization takes place, of course. And of course, that's all going on at the same time. Otherwise, they're going to eat the eggs, and that's probably where the losses come from, because many of them, many of them breed at the drop of a hat if things are right. Now, how do you tell the sexes in the tetras? Not always so easy. We're going to take a look at a a family here, a genus of tetras, which it is a little bit easier, but some of them are very difficult to tell apart. There are ways that you can sex them. Uh, sometimes the finnage development is much larger. By putting a strong flashlight behind some of the tetras, you'll see some of these are almost transparent, almost like the glass fish that we've looked at. You put a strong light behind the tetras and you can see the internal organs. You can see the uh, Oh, the swim bladder and all of the, uh, the plumbing, you know, the guts, okay. And in the males, the swim bladder is a little bit separated from the rest of that plumbing. In the females, that gap that's there is filled with the ovaries. So it's a little bit more opaque with a light behind it. Some of the fish have developed a kerosene hook. And one of the first tetras we're going to take a look at here has that kerosene hook. Now, this is one of the hemogrammas. This is the head and tail light. Hemogrammus ocellifer. But if I can catch a couple of these guys, we may get lucky. I'll show you what the kerosene hook is. There it is. You see how that fish is hanging by the ventral fin, the bottom fin? Was caught on the net with the kerosene hook. Now that's a male. No question about it. If you've got these fish and are feeding them well, as I've described, and you look down on them in this fashion, if all things considered, that is, if they're all eating well, that type of thing, then from the top, the females are going to be much plumper as they fill up with the eggs. But at least finding the kerosene hook, make sure you have a male. Now, the next customer that we've got in this beta tank is the Hemogrammus nanus, the feather fin. Now, this fish, this family, I keep saying family, it's a genus, Hemogrammus, 
And the next one we're going to take a look at, the Hyphesa Brycon, are part of the uh, of two that come into a subfamily arrangement. This is the gold tetra, Armstrongi. Now, hemogrammus means half line. Now, before we go on here, let me just say that these two uh, group, these two genera that I'm looking at here, hemogrammus, Hyphesa Brycon, belong to a subfamily that has another one of these big long names, but the first part of that big long name is tetra, tetragonopterine. Tetra, which means four-sided. It refers to the fin that is upstanding and four-sided, and that's where the name of all of the tetras came from. Now, let's see. We've looked at three of these guys. We looked at the gold tetra there, and this is the uh, glow light tetra, Hemogrammus gracilis, and this is a beautiful little specimen. Very nice development colors on there. Now, the next one is one of the Hyphesa brycon. This is the black line tetra, this Hyphesa brycon Scholzi, named after Scholz, and a rather plain silvery fish. The predominant marking is the black line. Now, the difference between this guy as a Hyphesa brycon and the previous fish is that the scales on the body run a lot further out onto the tail on the hemogrammus than they do on the Hyphesa brycon. Very fall, small fish, you wouldn't even notice that. But now let's see, we're going down the line here. We've got some more Hyphesa brycons. These are all in that same uh, genus. So let's take a look at some of these. The first one is the Callistus. And this is uh, typical of the next four, if you will, in that these fish now are, are believed to be part of species and subspecies. You'll notice how similar they are. I want you to pay particular attention to the black mark on the shoulder of this fish a long bar-like arrangement, because you'll see how closely the markings parallel the serpi, which we're going to look at here in a minute, except for that dot. And of course, the teeth are different. That's the big definition. The next one is the uh, bleeding heart, the rubrostigma. And that's a beautiful name, rubrostigma. That says red mark. Okay, so there's the bleeding heart. And of course, that refers to that red spot that it develops on its side there. And then we have the old serpi. And this looks very much like that callistus that I showed you, but that black mark on the shoulder is a single black mark instead of that bar. And then we've got the old rosy tetra, the rosaceous variety. But again, you notice how much alike these are. And in these fish, the males develop long dorsals compared to the females. They're rather easy to tell. And the next one is the flame fish, flamius. That's a good name, I guess, Flamius. That sure says flame fish. Very brilliant red colors in these. The next one is the lemon tetra. And that's, uh, these are a little bit washed out. They get a rich yellow in them, the pulchra pinus. That's what that means, yellow fins. They get a nice rich color. And then in the last compartment are some albinos. And these, again, are hyphesa brycons. And look, to be a little bit like the lemon tetra, you can see that prominent mark in the uh, ventral fin there, probably uh, pulchra pinus again, but a little difficult to tell because the, the markings that we see on the other fish are so prominent. Here we lose all of those with the albinos, and you can see the red eyes on those guys, so they are albinos. And finally, before we get off of the desk here, in this 10-gallon aquarium, we've got three different kinds of fish. Two of them are named after Dr. Axelrod, and that black Line fish, there is the black neon. You see that guy darting around? It's Chiridon axelrodi. That's uh, wrong. Oh, and there's uh, the other fish in here. We got that one wrong. But the other fish in here is the uh, blind cave. This is a peculiar fish. This is the Anapicthes jordani. No eyes, you see. He has no eyes, but it doesn't bother him. Typical of uh, losing of one since this uh, guy has developed a very strong sense for feel. See, he knows that thing's right there. Never bumps into the glass. The blind cave tetra. And, of course, a lot of cardinal tetras in there, and that was the Chiridon axelrodi. So a beautiful collection of small tetras. Now, before we go take a look at a real <laughs> collection of small tetras, I'd like to talk for a minute about another phenomena in this aquarium. 
we looked at uh, the nitrogen circle or cycle sequence, whatever you want to call it, earlier, almost as though it was a phenomena unique to the saltwater aquarium. That is that in our aquarium, the animals in there, fish, whatever they are, are putting off waste material that are organic products and the end result is that they're introducing into the water ammonia, which under oxidation is converted to nitrites. And here's the problem with the tetras, very susceptible to nitrites. And of course, this continues on to nitrates, which are not near as toxic as these other two substances. But here is the problem with the tetras, the nitrites. Now in the saltwater aquarium, we've got a heavy calcium gravel base, which buffers the system and keeps the pH up. This is a problem here. If this is happening, you can measure it in your aquarium with different kits that are available, but along with a bloom in nitrite, which could be fatal to tetras and other new fish, there's a diminishing of the pH. So if you get a radical drop in the pH, shortly after setting up the aquarium or after adding a lot of fish, it's probably a bloom in nitrite. And if you've had trouble keeping the tetras, keeping them alive, that might be the problem. Now I got a letter here from a young friend in Cleveland. Gary says, uh, well, first of all, he says, would you let me know what is the best book that was written on aquariums and fresh water? That's, that's a tough one to answer with all the books I have. But I do have a real library. If anybody's interested in what I read, uh, be glad to give you a list of the books that I read and you know my recommendations, maybe what I think about them in terms of where they're aimed, you know, scientific, whatever. But Gary goes on to say, I have a 29 gallon tank and I have trouble trying to keep the chemical content of the water at a neutral level. Now neutral is 7.0 on the pH scale, okay? I always get a pH of 7.2. My question is, must the pH be exactly neutral? No, absolutely not. Leave the pH alone. You start playing with that pH continually, it's a losing battle. It's, it's something that's happening to the water from the crowd that's living in there. Let's say that you could get your pH to some point you figure is desirable. And let's also say you're practicing water changes. As Soon as you change the water, it's gonna go back where it was. And in the area you're living in, the guy in the pet shop, his water is going to be the same as yours. Leave it alone. You may have to change pH when you get around to trying to breed some of the delicate tetras. They like soft water, some of them. But in general, leave it alone. One of the problems with the water quality in the aquarium is very graphic right here. If you only had one aquarium, you might develop some very yellowish water like you see here and never notice it. Because if you look at this aquarium, it's clear, the water's a little yellow, but until you get a chance to compare it with this one down here, then you don't see how colored that water is. And of course, charcoal will take out that yellow, but that's a hint that there's organic dyes going in there from the fish waste, growth inhibitors, many things. So down in this aquarium, we've got a mess of uh, tetras. Where's my poker here? There it is. Now this is your basic uh, tetra soup, I guess you'd have to call it. And we're going to make a man out of the, one of the cameramen here, old Eddie's shooting these. And we've got a real crowd in here. We're going to pick out some of them. Now there's the black tetra again. But in particular, I want you to look at that one black tetra right there with all the ornate finnage. It's, there he is. You see the long dorsal fin? A better developed ventral fin, anal fin. And that's a genetically fixed that's black tetra, Gymnocorimbus ternetsi. That's a GTO variety, they refer to it as. But a fish you'd never find in the wild. This was developed under controlled breeding. Uh, let's see. Oh, now that guy with the red eye and the black bar in his tail that we're looking at, the glass tetra, is uh, Moncasia oligolepis. And this is a nice addition to the tank. Really beautiful fish, very flashy, metallic, always on the move. Nice tetra. Let me get down in here and scare these guys down. Uh, let's see what else we've got. Okay, oh, that little guy with the black fins that are so much bigger by comparison is the phantom, Megalomphotus megalopterus, black phantom tetra, very nice fish. 
that dorsal fin gets huge on these guys and makes a, again, a nice addition to the community tank. Good mixer. Oh, now here's one of the Emperor Tetras, named it a Brycon Palmeri, named after Palmer, of course, when we see that I on the end of a name. And this, again, is another addition, nice addition to the community tank, as all of these small Tetras are that we've looked at. Now, before we can talk about some more of these Caracities, some little larger ones, I gotta get the chart down. And in this tank, we've got uh, four different species of fish. And uh, well, I guess we can start with the old pink tail there. Poking his nose out, you can't see his tail very well. But that's him there, Calceus macrolepidotus. Large scales, that says, macrolepidotus. This guy has very prominent teeth. The whole rotten world's crowded in one corner here. But he's relatively harmless in the aquarium, except that the males fight. They actually lock jaws, much like you see the cichlids doing. Now there's another South American caracidae, that spotted guy, the Exodon paradoxus. <clears throat> this guy gotta be a little bit careful of. They get aggressive at times, a little nippy, always going after each other like you just saw right there. But a beautiful fish, as you can see, all that brilliant metallic coloring. And here we have our silver dollars. Now the big guys are Matinus schreitmulleri. And these are, uh, of course, the trade name of the fish, silver dollars, or Matinus. The hobbyists use that for all of these types of fish. But actually, this fish, which is sometimes called a red hook Matinus or silver dollar, is a Mileus rubropinus. Rubropinus, red fin. Good name for that fish. And there are three or four Matinuses, if you will, that all look this same shape and size. But if you've got these guys in your aquarium, remember one thing, they're gonna eat your plants up because as aggressive as their cousins, the piranhas are with meat, these guys are just like that with respect to plants. So watch those caracity. Now, until we get together next week, when I, as I said, we're gonna talk about breeding, Keep that in the back of your mind always, water quality. It applies so well to the tetras because of their susceptibility to problems. So, can we get together again, water quality. Mm -hmm.